You're listening to the Health Coach Nation podcast. My name is Haley Rowe, and I'm a business coach for online health coaches who want to attract their ideal clients, stop feeling defeated by their never-ending to-do list, balance a healthy lifestyle with their growing business, and stop overanalyzing what everybody thinks of them so that they can confidently own their message and online presence. On this podcast, we dive deep into health information you can share with your clients, business strategy tips, and more. Let's get to it. Okay, I am back here today with Jason Ryer, who is a fasting expert, and he has a new program coming out called the Faster Challenge, where he takes people through fasting in their own way, in their own uh, personalized way for their lifestyle, and allows them to see the benefits of eating within a time-restricted window. Now, if you haven't listened to part one of this episode, I highly recommend going there first. And now that we are in part two, we're going to dive a little bit more into who fasting is not for, um, who, how you should ease into fasting, things like that. So here I am with Jason. And Jason, my first question for you today, when we were talking about our dads and how they've experienced fasting and the benefits, and they both started out not with the best health. Um, I, I just want to share with you that my dad, for a while, thought that Diet Coke counted as what he could have during the fasting time. And I was like, no, no, that that is not what should be involved in your fast. And um, so my question for you is, is for the people who want to be really strict, you know, um, I want to know, does coffee count? And does, I've also heard that under 50 calories can still count as a fast. And then I've also heard that fat during your fast in a beverage form can still count as a fast. So what are your thoughts on that for the perfectionist? I really don't think people should be, most people should be stressing about just starting to implement this, but I know there's going to be some people listening who want to know. Uh, So what do you think about that? Yeah, this is, Probably, Haley, this is probably the number one question that comes up over and over again, despite what I, like, I'll, I'll tell you what I think. And then people, the same people will come back later and say, well, well, what do you think about coffee? And I'm like, well, I just told you like a few days ago. Um, and, and this is where it gets a little complicated and a little confusing. And it kind of goes back to like, choose your own adventure. It depends on your goals and do what works for you ultimately. Because um, I guess it's a scary prospect for a lot of us to give up things like coffee, right? Um, so so in terms of what you can and cannot eat or consume during a fast, um, yeah, if you're, you know, if you want to be strict about it, if you want to be a perfectionist, whatever it is, then a water-only fast is, is probably recommended. And so if we're getting started and you're just doing 13 hours of fasting, then you shouldn't be worrying too much about coffee and all these things. I, I'd say you should be able to go. 13 hours without a cup of coffee. Um, And that's something I tell my students is like, well, recognize that coffee is a stimulant. um, And we do have a natural spike in cortisol, which gives us energy in the morning when we wake up. So I would say, do your best to tune into that natural spike in energy, and then figure out if you really need the coffee or when you need that coffee. Um, In terms of fasting, so if if you're fasting, and you drink black coffee, generally that's okay, right? So uh, I'm not going to come to c- come down too hard on my students. Although I during the program, I tell them, you know, try to go at least a day, a few days, up to a week with, with just water, like pure water fasting, just to experiment what it's like. Because I want people to understand what it feels like to, to wean themselves off all of these, these crutches that they have. Um, the, the challenge with coffee, and a lot of people say, like, no coffee at all, even they, they, they know black coffee is okay, but they'll say no coffee because they know that most people have cream or sugar or something else in their coffee that's adding, adding calories and potentially, um, quote, unquote, breaking their fast. And I say, quote, unquote, breaking their fast because certainly it's diminishing the benefits of the fast in certain ways. But the, the extent that it's doing that, we don't really know for sure, right? So, so this is where it comes to like self-experimentation. So if you, if, if you were to say like, I have to have coffee with milk or cream in it every day, 
and I'm not going to change that, then I would say, well, well, great, do that during your fast and see what happens, see how it works for you. Um, because I know that you're diminishing some of these effects of, of fat burning and cellular cleanup. What we talked about before in terms of autophagy, it's actually you're not going to get as much of the benefit. So it really depends. But then you have people go to the other end of the extreme and they think that more is better, right? More fasting is better um, without water, without anything. And this can be dangerous as well um, because you have to be smart about it. If you're going multiple days without food, you do need minerals, you need electrolytes, that sort of thing. So um, you, you do wanna get a good high quality sea salt or electrolyte supplement if you're going more than two days without food. Um, so so these, these are things that we teach. Uh, I teach my students. So there are a few nuances here and there. And then, and then in terms of just like pure fat, we talked about that. Um, and this, this is like, you know, I think a lot of us are, have heard about keto and the ketogenic diet. So this is where the, the idea behind the ketogenic diet comes into play is that if you're just eating fat, and no carbohydrates, then you're still getting the benefits of, of fat burning to some extent, right? And I say to some extent, because if you're eating fat, your body's still processing it and using that. And so that's, that's kind of potentially another crutch, but it can also be a way to, to hack or biohack it to help you get the benefits faster. So those are, those are things that we learn as well in the fasting courses. How do we use these as tools to actually ramp things up a little bit faster. I'm so glad you touched on this because preparing for a fast and doing a fast and easing into it is so important um, in what tools you use and how you go about it. So there's a few things that you just mentioned that I want to um, summarize and also share a few uh, additional ways to ease into fasting. So the first thing that you said is you got to make sure you have enough minerals. Um, so using uh, like what you said, pink Himalayan sea salt or supplementing with some kind of there's uh, trace mineral drops or there's mineral drops that I've gotten on Thrive Market before um, to put into water. That's really important because we're going for optimal healthy fasting. We're not trying to obviously feel <laughs> like muscle cramps and things like that. And some of those things can happen if you have a really out of whack, if you're drinking a ton of water and peeing out all your electrolytes, that can happen. And then the other thing that you mentioned is start with, first of all, just backtracking for those of you getting obsessed about coffee and black coffee and is it okay? And just start with what's a, a represents a improvement for you if you're easing into fasting. So maybe right now you have never even done a 13 hour water only fast. And so start there and ease into it and don't, you know, concern yourself about having black coffee or tea or something like that during your fast. Always ask what's the next improvement for me that I can sustainably do. And then the other thing that you said um, was easing into fasting by using fat as a way to curb your appetite or your hunger, um, but not have an insulin spike, meaning that hunger, that hormone that tells your body to start storing fat instead of burning fat, right? Is that kind of what insulin does? Tell me more about that insulin relationship with um, fat and sugar and th being a carb burner versus being a fat burner. Yeah, so so Haley, you cut out just a little bit on my end there, but um, but I think um, you asked about you know the the effect of of insulin during the fast, um, and and that's something that um, I guess just to touch on another one of your points. Um, some of the, the effects that, like the, the bad effects that are pretty common when we're fasting are like headache, you feel tired, you feel cold, that sort of thing. Um, and so these are indications of our bodies fighting back for various reasons. Um, and one of those reasons may be a lack of electrolytes or good mineral supplements in our bodies. And so that's when you want to try drinking more water and get some good like high quality sea salt in there. Or electrolytes to help balance that out. Um, in terms of the the metabolic process that happens when you are fasting, yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it helps with your insulin for sure. It helps with insulin sensitivity. Um, and what what's going to happen is that you're going to start burning through a lot of your glycogen stores, so glucose that comes from sugars and carbohydrates that we store in our liver as energy. Um, we'll start burning through those. So, and I think this is an important port, 
an important point. I mean, I don't think we want to get too sciencey on this, but but we do store glucose as energy, so carbohydrates as energy. And most of us, you know, standard American diet, that's our primary fuel that our bodies use and our brain uses. And so when you're fasting, we're depleting that. And it takes maybe 24 hours or so to fully deplete our glycogen stores to the point where our bodies don't have any more glucose. So this is where things really kick in, where your body says, okay, we really need to ramp things up to figure out where else we're going to get energy. And guess guess what other energy we have? Um, we store fat as energy. Um, so humans are really good at doing that. Other animals are really good at doing that as well. Um, bears hibernate during the winter. Um, and in fact, um, one little tidbit of, of trivia I throw out there to people, um, I often ask them, well, how long do you think is the longest that somebody's gone without food fasting on record? And um, and it's always interesting for me to hear what people's answers are. And I don't know if I want to answer that here on the podcast, but um, but it's it's probably it's it's a lot bigger number than than you're thinking, for sure. But the point is is that this is a survival mechanism for us to store fat and then later burn it. So so when we're fasting, we burn through our glycogen stores, and then we we switch over to burning fat as fuel. And that's what we're really teaching our bodies to do. And it, it can be quite a shock to go from, you know, standard American diet, just dependent on glucose, carbohydrates, and then switch over to fasting. Um, your your body's going to protest for sure. Absolutely. So there are ways to make that easier. And like we talked about, easing into it is probably the best ways that you can do that. But then you can also... Um, if you need some, some crutches, so to speak, um, you can do like uh, fats, just fatty foods. Um, you can try like bulletproof coffee, which is butter and MCT oil blended in coffee. Um, and that can be not only a crutch in that case, but it'll actually kick you into fat burning mode a little bit faster. So it can actually speed things up in a sense. Okay, awesome. And so... Um... Another way, though, another thing that I think might be pretty important. So first of all, if your diet is just so horrible, I think the first step would be to start cleaning it up first, would you say? Because I think fasting becomes easier when your diet's already pretty healthy. You don't have all these crazy blood sugar spikes. Um, and set yourself up for success with nutrient density when you are eating, because when you um, are fasting and doing intermittent fasting, and then during your eating window, you're just eating junk. Uh, that's not a, a win because you're not really restoring nutrients and getting your body what it needs. And so one of the things that I did when I was, I told you about um, when I did a test group where I was doing a three-day fast one time with a bunch of women, and um, we were measuring symptoms and how we felt after and everything. And I too, they had us about a month beforehand, they had us eat lower carb, eat um, more higher fat, moderate protein, kind of a ketogenic based diet, uh, which I've talked about in past podcasts. If you want to check out haleyrow.com slash keto hyphen diet. But anyways, I was doing this diet for about a month beforehand because it put me into a state of being metabolically flexible, being able to burn off my body fat and not be only always being a sugar burner is what we call it. And so then when I did the longer fast, it felt so much easier than when I had tried in the past. And because I was just kind of smooth sailing, I was I was already used to, to being able to burn off my body fat, right? So I think that, and I don't know if I'm phrasing that correctly, but the bottom line is I think it will be easier for yourself when you clean up your diet to start doing intermittent fasting just because your body's not hungry for nutrients, and, you know, going to be having spikes and crashes, and um, it just puts you in a better setup mode. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. And that that's where I lean towards like a ketogenic diet or some kind of form of low-carb diet. So ketogenic is a severely restricted carbohydrate diet. So so basically cutting out all sugar carbohydrates. And what that does is it actually mimics a lot of these things that you get from fasting in a lot of ways because you're not getting those carbohydrates 
like I said, and it forces your body to burn fat. So, um, so there, yeah, there are so many things you can do to, to clean up the diet. Um, and one, one is cutting out processed foods, cutting out sugars, um, cutting out a lot of these, these bad things. Um, though I've had, you know, anecdotally, I've had students cause my students, when they go through the, the program and the challenge, the faster challenge, they report what they eat. And, uh, I actually had a student report in the same day that he ate Oreo cookies and McDonald's. And I said, I said, Hey man, I don't think this is really, you know, optimal. Like this isn't benefit, you know, he's like, but my blood pressure is better. Like I'm still losing weight. Like he's still seeing all these benefits from the, the fasting. And he's like, yeah, I guess I, I can clean things up a little more. And yeah, there's, there's absolutely more, more that you can do. But, um, but I guess part of the take home there is that fasting does, it really does help even if you do have a, a bad diet, but it's not an excuse to, to eat junk food and, and have a bad diet necessarily. Yeah. I would love to talk about who fasting is not for. Um, and then I would also love to dive into how to make a fast, your first fast easier and successful and success tips, which we did touch on some of them, but I have a few more that I'd like to discuss with you. So first, who is fasting not for? Yeah. And that's, um, that's been a harder and harder question to answer because I'll look at like, um, you know, the, the conventional answer is, um, pregnant women, newborns, young children. Um, and then you can go on, uh, high level athletes, diabetics, uh, people with eating disorders. Um, so certainly you can name those. And I would, I would actually argue that fasting is for everyone. Um, even the, the people I, I mentioned, um, and you have to be careful. I mean, obviously you have an eating disorder. Um, it can, it can be, very, very detrimental in that sense. Um, but, but yeah. And then for like high level athletes, yeah. If you need more calories, if you're restricting calories too much, because let's be clear when you're fasting, you are restricting calories most likely. Um, and that's what they found in the studies naturally. Yeah. Just by compressing your eating window to a lot smaller, you're, you're going to be eating less calories. But uh, for high-performing athletes, maybe they need more calories. And so they're not doing their body any service by restricting calories too much. Um, but these are kind of like fringe cases, I think. I think anybody can go 13 hours, I hope, without food and reap some of those benefits. Yeah, for sure. it depends on what kind of fasting we're talking about, too. You're right. So like 13 hours, you know, most, maybe most of those, maybe, you know, athletes and things can can do that. But if we're talking about like the 24, the three day, the blah, 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 I really do think that people with eating disorders should not do um, any type of fasting until they've, you know, really feel that they're not doing it for weight loss. Um, and I personally, when I did a three day fast, I was very clear with myself that I was not doing it for weight loss because they you gain the weight back if you're losing water weight pretty much. But the bottom line is you are burning some body fat and you are going to have my immune system was way better and my skin cleared up and my, I was like euphoric on day three. Day two was nearly impossible. I thought I was going to die, but I, um, you know, I just, it was something so powerful for me as far as just realizing I'm capable of so much more than I think I am. And it was more of like a spiritual thing. Like I really had time to like reflect and like just, I don't know. It was just this very freeing thing for me. Um, but I would say, yeah, you know, pregnant women, obviously growing kids, uh, uh, people with eating disorders, all of that. You should always talk to your doctor, always see if it's for you. There is no one habit I would say is for every single human being on this planet. But I agree that sometimes I think we get a little too, little over the top where we say, you know, you can't do it if, if it's 13 hours, you can't, you know, that's pretty normal if you're sleeping for nine hours or eight hours or whatever. And yeah, but anyways, so I think that's a really good way to uh, categorize who maybe shouldn't fast. And then when we start fasting, I said this before to you on this, before this call, I said to Jason that the only time I had ever, um, been successful with this three-day fast, which I really wanted to do because I've read all about the science and the benefits of it. And I knew how it heals like leaky gut and blah, blah, blah. And 
I told him that the only reason why I think I did it was because I had skin in the game, meaning I invested in a test group program um, where we were all doing it together. I had accountability. I had preparation before the fast, meaning I changed my diet to be higher fat, low carb, so it was an easy transition for me. And I really had no choice but to stick with it because I had already committed to being a part of this test group and sharing my my symptoms and reporting, you know, things. So tell us how we can be successful aside from number one, preparing ourselves with maybe shifting to a lower carb diet. Number two, making sure we're getting enough electrolytes during the fast, drinking enough water, getting enough sleep, et cetera. Um, what else can we do to be successful? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I'm glad you brought that up because even though I run courses and programs, I always forget to bring up that point that um, adherence uh, goes way up. It goes through the roof when you know you're in it with a group of people. And on top of that, if you're paying for it, you have even more skin in the game, and you're more likely to do it, and more likely to succeed and meet your goals. So absolutely, that, that's a big part of it. And then as we dive into it, we, you know, like we said before, it's it's really a progression. So the an analogy I like to use is like if you're the if you go to the gym for the first time you're not gonna pick up a 100 pound dumbbell and start doing curls. You're gonna start with something light and progress your way up, right? And I like to think of fasting as the same way. So start you know, with the minimum effective, minimum effective dose of like 13 hours, and then work your way up. You know, Do that for maybe a week, and then 16 hours for the next week, and then work your way up to one meal a day, and then try at some point a 24 hour fast, right? And then if you're comfortable with that, you can start playing around, around with like extended fast, fasts and that sort of thing. Um, but then in terms of other things that will help, um, like we talked about going into a fast, like cleaning up your diet in general, um, perhaps cutting out carbs, that can help make things a lot easier. Um, and then using these supports and crutches and that sort of thing. And we actually, for some of my more like advanced students, people who have been, been through the program, as well as some friends, you know, friends that uh, we share the the biohacking community. I brought them on to do a 60-hour fast that we we called we we fully biohacked it. So it was a, a biohacked fast, which meant that we were using supplements to really kickstart the fast and support us through the fast. Um, and some of the things we were using were things that I've mentioned here. Um, so uh, ketones. Uh, MCT oils, so you can take ketone supplements that actually kick your body into ketosis and fat burning. MCT oils do much of the same thing. And then we were taking uh, like bone broth, collagen peptides to support protein. And then, and then also we were looking at some other things. Um, I'll, I'll stop there, or else, or else I think I'll, I'll lose people with a lot of supplements. That's that's why I said it's more, it's more advanced. Um, so so those are the things we get into. Uh, for people who really, you know, they want to do more than a two-day fast, but they don't really, you know, they they want to make it easier and they, and they want to make it more effective. Nice, sure. nice. Yeah, and you know what? I would love to, since we're coming to the end, uh, towards the end of the episode, the bottom line is listen to your body and, you know, start small. And if you have to stop, you have to stop. I mean, what's most important is that you are doing what works for you long term. And as long as you feel good, that's what's most important. Um, but I like your tips to be successful. Having that accountability is huge. So overall, I think those are some really good tips. And tell us um, about when the Faster Challenge launches, how people can get signed up, um, and just kind of the before and after of what they'll get when they join the program. Yeah, yeah. So so definitely want to get into that. But one thing I missed is I think you touched on Haley was, was finding like your freedom from food. So I know uh, fasting can be somewhat of a, a dirty or negative word for a lot of people. So what I encourage people to think of it as is your freedom from food. So, so you're really, you're not fasting, you're just taking a break from food, which is something else we didn't get into a whole lot is that now this frees up time and gives you more money to do a lot of other things that that you want to do. So, so for me, when I'm doing my, my fast and not eating, you know, typical breakfast, I have my entire morning up until noon 
to just get a lot of things done. And so that's really my freedom from food, where I can just focus and do the things that I want to get done. Um, so I just wanted to clear that up. And then, um, and then in terms of, yeah, the faster challenge. So that's coming up the first week of January, starts on January 8th. Um, and it's really the most simple way to burn fat, to turn on your brain and look and feel superhuman. So without worrying about losing muscle, you don't have to worry about counting calories. Even if you have bad eating habits, I think this is really helpful. Um, so people are going from like out of control weight, weight gain, eating a lot of damaging foods, and then their brain shuts off. And this is something I didn't understand until I got into this. It was like, like, oh, my brain doesn't work after I eat. And this is something we call brain fog. Um, so feeling fat and weak, um, and just a lot of insecurities and struggles around eating that, that lead to feeling like unappreciated and, and being judged by other people. So we take people and transform them into food really simply not being on their minds. Um, and then using fasting as a tool to really detox and cleanse their bodies to really get to an energized, focused flow state where they're healthy and they're strong, confident, successful, and they feel now valued and respected. Right. So this is a huge transformation for people. Um, and we go into a lot of different things. So the fasting program talks about the benefits of fasting, some of the things that we got into today, um, what it is, different types of fast, the myths, the tips, FAQs, um, why you eat too much. And we get into one of my favorite subjects, like psychology and biology of fasting. Right. And that that's a big one. Um, and I have some really cool resources. Um, you know, there's there's one book called The Hungry Brain by Stephen Guillenet, uh, which I hugely recommend. And I definitely cite that many times throughout the course. Um, and then using fasting to burn fat, learning about how that produces, gets us into a state of ketosis, um, cleansing, detoxing, healing our bodies. And then what I just talked about earlier, boosting productivity. So now you have time. You're not spending as much time thinking about food buying food, preparing food, eating food, now you have time to do other things and a bit more money, perhaps. Um, and then, you know, people ask, well, can I exercise? And this is something we didn't get into. Yeah, absolutely. You can exercise while you're fasting, but you want to do it sensibly, right? And that's, that's something we get into. Um, and how to make fasting easier, like I talked about. Some of these cool, like, biohacks to make it easier. And then finally, like, therapeutic fasting, so this is what happens, like all of these benefits, like people who are concerned about chronic illness, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, all of these things, uh, we address that um, with, with some of the associations between that and, and fasting. So, um, you know, the nuts and bolts of the program is really just practicing fasting with a group of peers, tracking and sharing what you eat, staying accountable with the coach and support of a group. And then learning how food and fasting affect your body and mind. Um, and we do this as a challenge, like I said. So students earn points. They compete for prizes and participate in live weekly video calls. So like I said, it starts on January 8th. It lasts for six weeks. Um, and I'm opening it up this time to just 15 students. Woo! You heard it here first. 15 spots. So be sure to sign up before the end of the year. Uh, maybe this is your New Year's fun jump start. And um, Jason, thank you so much for catching me up so much on fasting and uh, for sharing all your resources and tips and hacks. And for people, uh, just in case they're listening to this episode and they really want to dive deeper, number one, obviously go to your challenge. Um, but number two, there's some good experts uh, that we mentioned today on the show that I just want to summarize. So in case they want to check it out, they can. Uh, Dr. Rhonda Patrick has some good studies and uh, tips when it comes to time-restricted eating. Sachin Panda has some great ones. Um, Jason Fung um, and Dr. Pampa. Uh, and Ben Greenfield has some good fasting episodes as well. So I'll list those people in the show notes and obviously list Jason, the go-to expert of all. And be sure to uh, join and let me know if you have any questions. I'll connect you with Jason. And Jason, where can everybody find you on social media? Social media? Um, I'm on Instagram, Jason.Ryer. Uh, so just my first and last name. Um, and then on Facebook, same, Jason Ryer. I have a Facebook page, uh, Zen Strength, and then, of course, my website, website is zenstrength.fitness. Excellent. All right. Thank you so much, Jason.
Thank you, Haley. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Be sure to get your free gift over at HaleyRowe.com by joining my email list. And remember, you can always connect with me and other health coaches in the Health Coach Nation free Facebook group where I post trainings and videos on how to take your health coaching business to the next level. Can't wait to connect with you. Have an awesome day.